Hello and welcome to our webinar on Managing Cyber Legal Risk in the Internet of Things. Thanks very much to everyone for joining us today to discuss this important topic. Connected devices play an increasingly integral role in our daily lives. Medical devices, home appliances, fitness trackers, and countless other smart devices bring consumers the benefits of increased connectivity. In some respects, smart devices are beginning to dominate market share. More and more car models, for example, come with connectivity standard rather than as a special feature, and consumers are becoming more and more accustomed to deep integration of connected devices into their homes. The Internet of Things stretches well beyond the home, of course. There are numerous industrial, commercial, infrastructure, and agriculture applications, for example, that are bringing cities into the future, making manufacturing processes more efficient and infrastructure safer. The increasing integration of connected devices into our daily lives informs much of our presentation. As I was preparing for this webinar, I realized I have now been advising on IoT-specific legal risk for over five years. In other words, while still evolving rapidly, this is no longer truly an emerging technology. Likewise, legal expectations around the Internet of Things are increasingly settled. This means, in turn, that companies that manufacture, distribute, or otherwise rely upon connected devices should have increasingly mature IoT security programs, including with respect to relevant governance structures and policies and procedures. In short, the Internet of Things and its associated legal risks is here today, and companies should not wait to address the associated risks. We're going to focus today on practical steps that companies can take to mitigate these risks. We hope that you find these tips helpful as you work to manage legal risks presented by OT in the context of your own businesses. Three themes are particularly likely to recur as we discuss these risks and mitigation strategies. First, IoT cybersecurity presents a series of issues that are similar to, yet distinct from, those raised in the enterprise cybersecurity context. A company consequently will benefit from effectively leveraging the expertise it has in, from the enterprise context, while also effectively mitigating the distinctive risks associated with connected devices. Second, process is important. IoT cybersecurity is rapidly evolving and requires collaboration across multiple groups, many of which may have little or no experience working with each other. As a result, companies will benefit from de developing sound processes that allow them to respond effectively and consistently to challenges while drawing upon the relevant stakeholder groups within their organizations. Third, legal expectations of companies are growing. The Internet of Things is not new anymore, and standards, whether in formal best practices developed across an industry or formal technical standards are increasingly common. While well, five years ago, it may have been fairly common for companies to be beginning to think about IoT cybersecurity, that is certainly no longer the case. Companies that are not investing in the security of the connected products they manufacture are likely to be falling behind the expectations being set within their industry. My name is Stephen Lilly, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington DC office and a member of the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy and Litigation Practices. I advise clients on a broad range of cybersecurity issues, including managing litigation and regulatory risk, internal governance, incident response, and addressing risks posed by the Internet of Things. Before joining Mayor Brown, I worked for the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee as Chief Counsel to the Subcommittee on Crime and Terrorism, where I had a particular focus on cybersecurity. Joining me today is my co colleague, Veronica Glick, who is a Senior Associate in Mayor Brown's Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Practice. She counsels clients on a variety of complex legal issues regarding incident response and regulatory compliance. Veronica serves on a pro bono basis as Deputy Chief Counsel for Cybersecurity and National Security to the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission. We're going to be talking about cyber risk today. We're lawyers after all and are paid to worry about things. I don't want to lose sight of the fact, however, that the Internet of Things presents enormous opportunities for businesses as well as brings consumers countless benefits. Indeed, consumers' interest in these products is reflected in rapid adoption rates across numerous different product categories. These opportunities do come with significant risks, however, as we'll discuss today. A cybersecurity vulnerability or incident that affects a connected IoT device can lead to significant litigation and regulatory enforcement actions, not to mention reputational harm and lost consumer confidence and market share. So that's the bad news. The good news is that companies can mitigate these legal risks and they can use familiar tools to do so. To be clear, there is no one size fits all strategy. A company that manufactures a connected car will likely select a very different set of security controls than a company that manufactures a connected toy. 
Still, the building blocks of such risk management strategies are likely to be fairly consistent across product categories. First, companies will want to consider how to organize themselves internally to manage product cyber risk. A broad set of internal stakeholders is likely to have an important role to play in product cybersecurity, including the security team, the R&D group, the quality and or safety group, as well as the regulatory affairs, communications, customer service, and of course, legal teams. Many of these stakeholders will also be involved in enterprise cybersecurity, but typically will be a broader and more disparate group than seen in the enterprise context. Practically speaking, many of these groups may not have worked together extensively in the past, and it may take work to build trust between the groups. One dynamic we have seen across companies, for example, has been uncertainty as, as to how to integrate input from security teams into quality processes, and resulting doubt whether security concerns are being either adequately considered or unduly prioritized over other issues. Creation of appropriate governance bodies, such as coordinating committees, can help address these risks by allowing escalation and resolution of such issues. Second, Focusing on security throughout the product lifecycle will be an important step towards mitigating product cyber legal risk. Regulators generally expect companies to maintain secure development life cycles, to manage cyber risk throughout the time the product is in the field, and ultimately consider how the end of support will be managed. This is an example of how expectations for companies in this field have raised over time. A few years ago, few companies would have had robust integration of security into the R&D process or, or into their supply chain management. Now, however, it is increasingly standard for companies to incorporate security considerations from the earliest stage of the product lifecycle. To be clear, this is very hard work, particularly for companies that make low-cost products or that are highly dependent on the practice of a diverse group of suppliers. Building security into design processes, for example, can create significant expense and potential delay. Now more than ever, however, companies are building in security from the initial architecture diagrams through secure coding practices, code reviews, and pre-market penetration testing. Third, vulnerability management is a critical building block of managing security risk for fielded products. At this point, many leading companies have built robust vulnerability management processes that account for the many different channels through which the company may learn of a vulnerability, provide for appropriate assessment, prioritization, or remediation of the vulnerability, and allow for effective delivery of a patch or update to the affected devices. That level of vulnerability management is increasingly expected across industries. That said, it simply may not be possible for a company to accomplish all of these steps, particularly if it manufactures a low-cost product, it has difficulty reaching consumers, or the, products they have, or the products they have purchased, or if replacement is the only real option for mediation. Whatever level a company can achieve, building sound processes around the reasonable approach the company adopts will allow it to reduce legal risk. Fourth, Companies can focus on responding effectively to cyber incidents affecting products. Much like vulnerability management, effective incident response requires collaboration across appropriate stakeholder groups, along with an increased emphasis on responding efficiently to vulnerabilities that have already been exploited in the real world. This is often an area of initial focus for companies looking to enhance their product cybersecurity programs, both because it often can build from familiar incident response processes on the enterprise side as well as because incident response capabilities typically can be developed without long-term technical development or budget commitments. Fifth, engaging with policymakers can help mitigate legal risk. A comparison with enterprise cybersecurity is instructive here. Expectations are fairly settled in the enterprise context, and generally speaking, legislative and regulatory developments typically do not swing dramatically in one direction or another. The policy sphere is more dynamic and fluid in the product cyber context. Legislative proposals at the state and federal levels could significantly affect the obligations of product manufacturers, and it will be particularly interesting to watch regulatory activity if the administration changes in the upcoming presidential elections. Of course, complicating things, product manufacturers cannot turn on a dime. Development cycles are long and products remain in the field for years. It consequently will be important for manufacturers of connected products to engage with policymakers to ensure that policy solutions are reasonable and workable in this context. Let me make one final point here. One of the recurring comments you'll hear today is the importance of effective collaboration and coordination across stakeholder groups. It also bears mention that there likely will also be a need for collaboration within the legal team. Many organizations, for example, will have separate attorneys that are responsible for data privacy and enterprise cybersecurity, others who work with the R&D team and the quality or safety teams, and yet others who work with the procurement department or the regulatory affairs team. 
However the legal team is structured, it will be important for the work of the various attorneys to be effectively coordinated, including through internal legal team processes or playbooks as appropriate. We're going to start by level setting on cyber threats to connected products. We'll cover the types of attacks connected devices face and the potential consequences for companies. Then we'll talk about legal risks associated with these devices, briefly highlighting the regulatory and litigation consequences that can follow from product cybersecurity issues. Following that, we'll discuss priorities for managing product cybersecurity and legal risks, focusing on practical steps that companies can take to reduce legal risks associated with key elements of IoT management. Finally, we'll answer questions that you submit to the extent that we have time. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. First, I've been asked to remind you that we recommend avoiding use of desktop virtualization software such as Citrix to the extent possible. Secondly, if listed under the FAQ widget on the right side of your screen, today's program is being streamed through your computer, so there's no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presentation. If you have any questions that are unanswered during the presentation, I invite you to submit them using the Q&A feature on the left side of your screen, and we'll do our best either to answer them during the session or to follow up with you after the webinar has ended. Regarding CLE credits, we'll be providing an alphanumeric code during the presentation. In order to receive CLE credits, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. These forms are also available to download on the right-hand side of your screen under resource list if you need them. With that said, let me turn it over to Veronica to cover cyber threats. Thanks, Stephen. So as Stephen noted, with all of the substantial opportunities presented for a range of industries by IoT, there are also notable cybersecurity risks specific to connected products. In our view, one of the key initial steps to understanding the threat landscape that your company faces is understanding the type of cyber attacks that the industry faces. So I'll, I'll briefly touch on um, the key threats to connected products and the trends that we're seeing. So the key issue to note here is that IoT is different from traditional data breaches. When we're thinking of IoT, we're also often talking about impacts in the physical world. So we've listed here some examples of the range of impacts and that can be caused by an attack. Um, most troubling, products can be manipulated to potentially cause injury. And one example that comes to mind from a recent uh, press story a couple months ago, uh, which claimed that vulnerabilities in smart baby bath nets could be manipulated to shake too fast or emit loud noises. So although vehicles are obviously um, a particular concern in this category, there's other devices that can that can face this unique risk. And then. Um, the devices can be used to attack other systems or to spy on unsuspecting users, which um, causes particular concern for our phones and home security devices, for example. And then there's a separate risk, of course, that uh, the attack will extract personal data from a connected device. So with those um, general types of attacks in mind, unfortunately, cyber attacks on IoT devices are also growing each year. And to make things more difficult, cyber criminals are adjusting their tactics to exploit the COVID-19 pandemic. So this risk of physical and um, other types of impacts, as you can imagine, can lead to legal repercussions from physical injuries, damages to products, data loss, and IP theft. And um, as Stephen will discuss, there are significant consequences that can flow from a vulnerability disclosure even without an actual attack. So businesses facing connected product recalls or public vulnerability disclosures will have to often deal with um, managing satisfied customers and returning devices. And on top of that, for these um, public incidents or disclosures, there may also be the factor of engaging with the media and regulators, which raises its own set of legal and practical challenges. So this pre presents um, a problem that's quite difficult for product development, safety, and quality teams to, to grapple with. Nowadays, there's a consumer demand to, for companies to push out connected products but there's this need to balance that pressure against reaching level of cyber maturity, which requires time and resources. So with that, sometimes companies will find themselves having introduced a connected product without having uh, developed a documented process for managing risks, established well-resourced product security teams, or developed strong working relationships among internal stakeholders. So this becomes a sort of chicken and egg problem. How do you justify investments in product security before uh, connected products are on the market? 
But the overall takeaway here is that the stakes are high for product cybersecurity. At the same time, uh, as counsel, your involvement in managing cybersecurity legal risk can significantly reduce the exposure of your business. Thanks, Veronica. I'm going to cover some regulatory issues um, first um, and then turn to Veronica's specific examples. So regulatory scrutiny of connected products is significant. Um, Veronica, as I mentioned, is going to give them some examples of approaches of individual regulators. But before she does, let me make a few observations about regulators' general approaches to IoT security. First, a broad range of regulators are engaging on IoT security, including in areas of overlapping jurisdiction. The presence of many different actors on the regulatory playing field creates the risk of competing or contradictory regulatory approaches. Fortunately, regulatory approaches have been fairly consistent so far, particularly to the extent that they share common roots in the NIST cybersecurity framework. Whether that continues to be the case in the future remains to be seen. Second, regulators have relied upon their full toolkits to address IT cybersecurity. While regulators' emphasis on various tools, from guidance to enforcement actions, may vary between administrations, it's notable that they've already made clear they're willing to use enforcement actions, recalls, and their full other sets of tools to address this issue. Third, regulators are focused on risk. They are not waiting for cyber incidents to affect IT devices before taking regulatory actions. Indeed, they are focused on the full range of risks that vulnerabilities pose to IT devices, including safety risks not only risks the security of data stored on the device. Being able to understand and mitigate those risks effectively can help companies achieve better outcomes in their regulatory engagement. So with that, let's turn to a few specific examples. Veronica? Thanks, Stephen. So as you likely know, the SEC has long been a leader in cybersecurity regulation in the United States. The FCC has identified IoT security as a priority area, focusing on a wide range of consumer products, um, routers, baby monitors, home security devices are some examples. And um, in a speech by FTC Commissioner Slaughter, she provided some insights into the FTC's sort of trust building perspective on device security. So after noting the many benefits of IoT devices, she raised the concern that these benefits may be delayed or foreclosed if consumers can't trust the device. So to build trust, she noted two fundamental components. First, ensuring that the devices are reasonably secure. And second, ensuring that consumers have a clear and accurate picture of what data their devices collect and how the, their data is stored and used. And here we've also listed a staff report on IoT that um, highlights various functions for security that they recommend, risk assessment, vendor management, program leadership, as we'll discuss. And in its guidance, the FTC often refers to security by design. And this means that security should not be an afterthought, but something that is designed into the IoT product and considered at every stage of development. It also implies that companies should test their security before they go live with the product. So the FTC is, is poised to pursue further enforcement actions against connected device companies for unreasonable data privacy and security practices. In these enforcement actions, they'll generally look to, um, among other things, statements that businesses have made about the security of their device and the steps taken to address known vulnerabilities in particular. So in addition to the FTC, which has broad authority over a wide range of devices, there are additional federal regulators that have authority over uh, specific categories of devices. Uh, so FDA is one example here. And the FDA has said that they recognize that connectivity can improve healthcare um, and has potential great benefits for patients. They also express a concern that a breach could also impact the safety and effectiveness of a device, which could directly impact the health of a patient. So to address those risks, the FDA has issued pre-market and post-market guidance for medical device manufacturers. The 2014 pre-market guidance advises medical manufacturers to address cyber risks in design and development of medical devices. And there's updated pre-market guidance in draft form um, that's been issued. This uh, pre-market guidance is focuses on asking manufacturers to identify threats and vulnerabilities and the likelihood that those will be exploited as they get the products ready for market and they also work to find suitable mitigation strategies. And the 2016 post-market guidance highlights the FDA's expectations 
that monitoring cybersecurity vulnerabilities should be done throughout the device's life cycle. An additional useful uh, item for businesses to look at is the um, FDA collaborated on a, a, a medical device cyber regional incident playbook, which walks through preparedness and incident response phases for health delivery organizations. And finally, it's also worth noting that the FDA has used its recall authority to address cyber vulnerabilities. Another example is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, which has been active on issues related to cybersecurity and connected vehicles. So NHTSA has issued guidance to weigh in on industry cybersecurity practices and set its expectations for going forward. NHTSA guidance directs stakeholders to approach these issues as part of a comprehensive and systematic approach to cybersecurity. So for example, NHTSA emphasizes the importance of developing appropriate plans and policies and what it calls implementation roadmaps. Uh, NHTSA is unique in that it sort of repeatedly emphasizes that it wants companies to document all decisions they make relating to vehicle cybersecurity. And this is also stressed that companies should build effective governance structures around cybersecurity, including through the appointment of dedicated high-level corporate officers to lead these efforts. And like other um, regulators, NISA's approach has been heavily influenced by the NIST cybersecurity framework. And NISA has also undertaken a uh, recall to address cybersecurity vulnerabilities. In addition to the um, regulations that are developing at a federal level, state laws are also emerging as a source of security standards for connected devices. As, as we often see in the cyber and privacy space, California has led the way here with a law that requires manufacturers to equip connected devices with reasonable security features. Oregon uh, also has a similar legislation in place and both went into effect in January of this year. Both of these laws have several exemptions. So for um, the laws don't apply to if your device is also subject to security requirements under other federal regulations. So if a device is subject to FDA regulations, for example. And generally speaking, what we know so far about the reasonableness and analysis that ex that's expected is that they'll take into consideration the function of the device, the information that it collects and transmits, and the steps that have been taken to protect, protect the device and the associated data. Um, interestingly, states specify that reasonable security feature includes a pre-programmed password, which is unique to each connected device, or a similarly secure way to authenticate each device. Still, I mean, in practice, this leaves a lot of unknowns, so it'll be a helpful area to keep an eye on the developments and see how um, interpretations of reasonable security develop for connected products. And so businesses more generally should be aware of laws in other jurisdictions where they operate. So in the EU, for example, the uh, European Telecommunications Standard Institute has also issued uh, cybersecurity standards for IoT devices that sets out a list of recommend, recommended goals for, for safer devices that includes no default passwords and managing vulnerability reports. And then separate from the federal and state regulations, the, there are, it's also important to be aware of non-regulatory agencies in this space because they can have a significant impact in practice on developing recommended and voluntary standards for securing connected products. So we won't go into all the, the details here, but we've listed a few examples of agencies that have in different ways highlighted areas of security concerns and then developed guidance and recommendations. So for example, one that regularly plays a role um, quite an important role is the ICS search group within DHS. The, this group publishes notices about identified vulnerabilities, their risk level, and what, if any, mitigations exist. And DHS has issued these advisories for a range of sectors, including medical equipment and tech, telecom. So we found that across multiple product contexts, DHS's view of the appropriate scoring of the vulnerability in the connected product can have a significant effect on the legal outcome for the relevant manufacturer. Because of this, effective engagement with DHS is often an important and valuable action that companies can take. Then one bigger picture item for consideration is that from a council's perspective, these standards, even though they're voluntary, are helpful to consider seriously as plaintiffs could argue in civil litigation that this non-regulatory guidance informs the standard of care. So let's turn from regulatory risk to the courtroom. 
I'm going to discuss IoT cyber litigation risks at a high level today, focusing on key risks and themes for companies to consider as they look ahead. Before I do, I should emphasize that IoT cyber litigation is already here. Numerous lawsuits have been filed in the past five years against manufacturers of connected cars, medical devices, baby monitors, and other products. As Veronica mentioned earlier, the, the nexus between IoT devices and the physical world creates risks that are different in scale and kind from those seen in the traditional enterprise data breach context. The possibility of personal injury or even death creates new categories of liability risks that simply are not present in the, in the context of data breach. IoT cyber litigation creates new liability risks even short of personal injury, however. Traditional data breach actions have often been subject to successful motions to dismiss for failure to allege injury whether relating to the Article 3 standing inquiry or is required to state a claim. In contrast, plaintiffs in IoT security litigation have a potentially broader set of theories of injury that they can rely upon. For example, various plaintiffs have alleged, often successfully, that they were injured by some loss of value in the relevant product because of the identified cyber issue. In short, future product cybersecurity litigation may create substantially higher financial exposure for a defendant and may not be susceptible to successful threshold motion practice. In other words, IoT litigation may both present greater liability exposure and be more likely to reach discovery than traditional data breach litigation. Unfortunately, IoT cyber litigation may be similar to traditional data breach litigation in at least one respect. Specifically, consumer class actions may be accompanied by derivative and securities actions as well as potentially breach of contract actions between manufacturers and their suppliers or other third parties. As I mentioned, we already have seen numerous pieces of litigation over the security of IoT devices. This litigation largely has not focused on actual attacks on connected products. Rather, it has focused on security vulnerabilities that the plaintiffs alleged appeared in the relevant products, alleging that those vulnerabilities either put the plaintiffs at risk of injury or cause the product to be worth less than the price the consumer paid for it. Some of this litigation has failed at the early stages, but that certainly has not been a universal rule. Indeed, some of this litigation has survived summary judgment and seen plaintiffs successfully certify classes that defendants have valued into the hundreds of millions of dollars. The stakes of this litigation are likely to continue to grow as there are more attacks on connected devices. As we've discussed, the nexus between connected devices and the physical world fundamentally alters their risk profile, and this is reflected in the types of litigation that manufacturers may face. This litigation is not only likely to create high liability exposure, but is also likely to be diverse in substance, forcing a company to draw upon a wide range of different litigation specialties. While no litigation is ever simple, data breach class actions at this point have a fairly predictable shape and trajectory. In contrast, IoT cyber litigation is likely to be more unpredictable in the near term, with novel threshold issues subject to dispute. As a result, I would anticipate that this litigation will lead to companies drawing upon not only class action expertise, but also product liability capabilities and appellate skills. Even when drawing upon those capabilities, and as discussed earlier, this litigation also may be more likely to survive threshold motions and proceed to discovery. Practically speaking, this will lead to a highly intrusive inquiry into a company's security practices, including the security decisions made by the company in the development of the subject products, what and when the company knew about the, any vulnerability or incident at issue in litigation, the risks posed by the vulnerability or incident, how the company responded to the vulnerability or the incident at issue, and whether there are other related vulnerabilities in the product that the company is aware of. Answering these questions will be particularly challenging if a company lacks robust and mature processes for managing cyber risks throughout the product lifecycle. Here, as highlighted earlier, process is likely to be critical as a company will want to be able to explain how it reached the security judgments it made and why those judgments were reasonable in light of assessed risks. With these regulatory so is... and litigation risks, sorry, <laughs> go ahead, Monica. Um, just in the same point, with these risks in mind, we'll jump to some practical guidance and priorities for managing these legal risks. So you've all probably seen plenty of headlines about hackers breaking into connected products, and these attacks are an increasingly common threat to businesses that pose unique legal and logistical challenges for victim organizations. 
incident response is perhaps the most challenging moment that many legal teams and technical teams will face. And as compared to a traditional enterprise breach, it is common that the stakes are higher for IoT incidents and they're also more difficult to manage. You're listed here on the right some of the distinctive features of product incident response. And as one example, the ability to address an incident is often more challenging for connected products. Whereas within an enterprise business, you can sometimes issue a patch centrally to all connected machines. Vulnerabilities in products may require product recalls. Different stakeholders are also involved depending on the depending on the business, and this is an area that varies uh, quite widely among clients. But connected product businesses will often involve a chief quality officer or a similar role that is a core member of the incident response stakeholder team. And IoT incidents in general may involve a broader set of stakeholders working together that do not usually work together on a day-to-day -day basis. So in-house counsel can have a really critical role here to play as part of a broad group of stakeholders to make sure they contribute to an effective incident response. Then we have the phases of incident response listed on the left, which for the incident response team will generally follow these defined phases. And as counsel, there'll be some issues you're thinking about from start to finish. You'll still track the general um, incident response processes, but there'll be some legal considerations that you can't entirely plan for. And we found that in-house counsel often needs to play things by ear and be prepared to be flexible, keeping an eye out for different issues as they emerge. And from but a bit, the big picture, from a legal perspective, throughout incident response, the key issues for the legal team to focus on are assessing obligations and understanding facts. And this is particularly important with uh, all of the data breach notification laws. So all 50 states and D.C. have these in place. There may also be contractual notifications with very quick timelines. And EU regulators also have very quick timelines for notification often. Another important factor, it should, can be challenging practice, is helping making sure the teams preserve evidence properly and making sure the team establishes and maintains privilege and work product protections over communications and reports. So especially with this larger group of stakeholders that's involved in an IoT incident, it can be helpful to set out clear rules early on for communications. Another uh, factor for legal teams to consider is often the engagement with various internal and external stakeholders. So it's of course important to make sure that statements to regulators and consumers are accurate and consistent. But depending on the scale and the geography that the a company and devices fall into, this can be particularly complicated, particularly if there's different regions um, at play, as we, we've seen often, it's quite complicated to balance different expectations from both regulators and consumers on the levels of transparency they expect and the speed of the response they expect. So, you, you know, one of the sub clients in one region may not realize that the public statement they're making to their consumers could have a regular impact on a regulatory investigation in another region. So, as counsel, we found that it's helpful to make sure you're really in the loop on all communications and to be very detail-oriented in tracking the content of those communications. And a, a final point to mention on um, incident response in terms of the, the team is the retention of key vendors. It can be helpful to do this in advance with whether it's forensic firms, crisis communications, um, or others to bring them in under privilege at the direction of counsel in advance of an incident. Particularly for external forensic firms, they can be valuable because they bring to bear a particularized expertise, which is often needed for IoT incidents. And then having this external firm provides a level of independent validation for statements that you may want to provide to third parties, to so law enforcement, regulators, or customers. But at a big picture, as Stephen noted at the outset, for IoT incidents, process predictability and coordination is really key to a successful cyber program, and that's particularly important for incident response. So we found that clients have um, found it helpful to supplement their incident response plan with a playbook, which can be a valuable way to guide a team through an incident. Playbooks are um, often a way to provide ready access to the governing plans and policies of the company, and they can also include helpful checklists and templates. Playbooks are not a, as crucial as incident response plans, and at this time, regulators are unlikely to expect that a company has a playbook. But they are a relatively simple way to introduce to um, introduce the team to the processes, which helps improve coordination and predictability. Vulnerability management is in many ways um, related to incident response. 
In fact, some companies treat incident response and vulnerability management as a single category, with the key distinction being that an incident typically involves the actual exploitation of a vulnerability. While definitions and approaches thus vary, I'm talking here about steady state processes for identifying and remediating vulnerabilities in products before they've been exploited by an attacker. The basic steps of vulnerability management are discovering and prioritizing vulnerabilities, developing a fix for the vulnerability, and delivering that fix. Of course, all of this discussion is premised on the notion that a device can be fixed. Some simple devices simply cannot be fixed and others cannot be reached once fielded in any practical sense. I'm going to set that group of products aside, but suffice to say that there are distinct and potentially significant legal issues associated with such devices, particularly if there is not an established understanding that they cannot be updated. For companies that do manage vulnerabilities on an ongoing basis, basis, the basic steps of vulnerability management are typically supported by appropriate policies and procedures, often reaching down to the level of detailed SLAs for performance of specific steps in the process. Likewise, this work is typically supported by cross-functional engagement or resources. A security team will have little success managing vulnerabilities, for example, if the product quality team will not move updates through their processes. So what are some priorities and corresponding pitfalls here? First, as I mentioned, it is important to have documented and reportable processes, and I apologize for sounding a broken, like a broken record on this point. Not only are such processes likely to be implicitly or expressly required by governing regulations, but litigation may ultimately raise tough questions about the reasonableness of decision-making in this context. Being able to point to a rational process that was appropriately followed will be a significant benefit for a company in this context. Second, Collaboration and coordination is critical as previously discussed. Companies that have built trust between responsible stakeholders who each know their relevant roles and responsibilities are more likely to succeed, both in terms of the substance of the response to the vulnerability and in avoiding unnecessary internal turbulence that could reflect poorly on the company in future litigation. Simply put, you don't want to be introducing people to each other for the first time during a vulnerability. Or to put it more bluntly, you want to avoid stakeholders within your company asking of each other, who are these guys? And why are you making my life difficult? I should say that I'm assuming that, from, that the audience from experience can imagine more colorful versions of these emails and how it can quickly spiral, creating unnecessary legal risk. Third, I want to particularly emphasize severity ratings. Companies are likely to have to deal with numerous vulnerabilities. They will have to decide which to prioritize and which merit different types of remedy. For example, think of a medical device. What are the lines for asking the patient to immediately return to their doctor versus to take certain precautions? Or well, think about a connected car. What type of issues require an expensive recall? Technical evaluation of the vulnerability is a critical input into that analysis. Again, however, there are key process points. In particular, security teams typically rely upon CVSS scoring or other defined security protocols. Those scoring mechanisms may not adequately account, however, for safety or other considerations, or map neatly to a company's existing safety rating framework. Think, for example, about cars. Let's say a vulnerability is discovered in a vehicle that allows a hacker to open a car's windows remotely. How should the car company rate that vulnerability compared to other security vulnerabilities? And perhaps more importantly, how should the company prioritize that vulnerability against technical engineering flaws such as a metallurgical weakness in a particular bolt in the vehicle's frame. Thinking through how to map security and safety or quality ratings to each other and how to resolve disagreements among teams is an important element of vulnerability management for most manufacturers of IoT devices. Penetration testing is one important input into the vulnerability management process. This is an area that we've seen a lot of companies struggle with, in part because of the chicken and egg problem that Veronica alluded to earlier. Performing penetration tests is risky if you do not have a robust process for responding to the penetration test results. At the same time, it is likely impossible to wait until you have built a Cadillac quality vulnerability management process before undertaking penetration testing. Put another way, penetration testing typically only delivers bad news, but it is bad news that a company needs to know and react to before hackers identify and exploit the vulnerabilities. 
Building a safe mechanism for identifying and addressing vulnerabilities is a priority for companies in this space. Again, expectations are rising in this area, and many companies already have developed mature processes that identify when and what is penetration tested and how identified vulnerabilities are scored and remediated. Since many companies continue to face challenges, however, let me briefly discuss some legal risks and potential options for mitigating those risks. First, this is particularly an issue for companies that are just starting on penetration testing. But one recurring challenge we have seen is that a penetration test may produce results that either create an inaccurate picture of the security of the device or that surprise the company. For example, an inexperienced penetration test company might write a report that overstates the safety impact of a vulnerability in a particular component. We've seen numerous penetration test reports, for example, that include inaccurate and misleading statements that describe a vulnerability as a safety issue simply because it appears in a product that is, is, that is itself safety critical. Performing the penetration test under privilege, at least until internal processes are mature, can help mitigate these risks and even at maturity, legal review can help reduce any risk of a test report including misleading or inflammatory language. Second, the timing of a penetration test can itself be a problem. Imagine the discovery of multiple critical vulnerabilities in a product that is about to launch. Such penetration testing can put a company in an impossible situation, forced to choose between appropriate security and maintaining market position. Fortunately, documented processes that provide for testing at appropriate times can reduce the risk of a company finding itself in that position. So we've seen companies run into this issue even despite having sound processes, so it's worth keeping on any legal priority risk. Third, it is of course risky to find vulnerabilities and not address them, whether within the secure development lifecycle before launch or through post-market vulnerability management processes for fielded products. One particular issue I'd highlight here is the importance of marrying up pre-market and post-market processes. For example, imagine that a company performs a penetration test on its new product and finds a particular vulnerability. At that point, the company likely should assess whether that same vulnerability appears in prior versions or other products. Maintaining a software bill of materials would be helpful to identify such other affected products, but the key point is, however a company achieves it, it should take appropriate follow-up steps from a penetration test. After all, in litigation, it is sure to be alleged to have known or to have ought to have known about the presence of the identified vulnerability in other products. Fourth, delivery of remediation may be difficult or even impossible, whether because the device is inaccessible or a key supplier has gone out of business. In those cases, a company will need to consider whether it is appropriate to communicate to customers about the risk and potential mitigation measures, such as limiting certain uses of the product. The company even may need to consider recall or product replacement. Finally, one recurring issue that we have seen is third parties asking for copies of penetration tests. A healthcare system may ask for penetration test results for medical devices, for example, or a fleet operator may ask for results of penetration tests into connected trucks. Most companies are likely to be very hesitant to share a full set of results. Contractual terms or commercial realities may nonetheless force a company to disclose at least a summary of the testing, perhaps limited to vulnerabilities of a certain severity. Companies will want to think about how they can do this safely and consistent with any privilege around the documents. More broadly, I'd also flag that customer requirements about product cybersecurity are increasing. So we anticipate increased pressure to negotiate product security standards and governing contracts going forward. Another topic that is related to vulnerability management is coordinated disclosure and bug bounty programs. As most of you likely know, coordinated disclosure programs provide a channel through which security researchers can engage with companies to report vulnerabilities and work with companies in remediation, often receiving some sort of public recognition at the end. In exchange, the researchers typically agree only to reveal details of the vulnerability after it has been remediated. Bug bounty programs further lay on financial rewards for researchers. These programs are increasingly encouraged by regulators and other policymakers, and frankly are increasingly standard for manufacturers of connected products. Companies increasingly engage constructively with the security research community, in, in part because the unattractive alternative is to have security researchers release vulnerabilities in, in an uncoordinated manner and likely to criticize the company in the process. There are nonetheless a legal risk associated with these programs. 
First, companies need to have sound remediation processes for fixing identified vulnerabilities or clear guidelines about what it does not fix. Practically speaking, companies are likely to have to further prioritize vulnerabilities identified by researchers as compared to if they had identified the same vulnerability through internal non-public testing. This can create pressure to remediate and potential internal challenges. For example, it is not uncommon for a product quality or R&D team to react with some frustration with pre when presented with the vulnerabilities identified by researchers, particularly if, in that group's view, the company unnecessarily invited such submissions. Again, collaboration and sound processes can help avoid such problems by allowing appropriate expectation setting in advance of actual issues. On top of that, reports through a coordinated disclosure program can raise safety issues and possibly trigger the company's incident response plan. Imagine, for example, if a researcher reports a safety-related vulnerability and the comp company subsequently identifies potential real-world exploitations of that vulnerability. I'm not going to cover all of the potential scenarios in which a coordinated disclosure program can give risk, rise to legal risk for the company. I frankly could spend a whole hour discussing that alone, and I imagine that many are obvious to this group. Let me just close by saying that thinking through and socializing those potential issues in advance can significantly, significantly decrease legal risk for companies. As Stephen has highlighted, coordination is an important element of maintaining effective product cybersecurity. At the micro level, this means ensuring that working teams across departments are connected with their peers and other organizations. More broadly, to manage some of these legal risks within a business consistently and appropriately, regulators have pressed for enterprise-wide leadership of companies' product cyber risk management programs. Helping companies set up government governance committees can be challenging and time-consuming to establish and maintain, but it creates the benefit of having all stakeholders in a room together working through these priority issues. And the structure of these governance committees will, will vary. For example, a foreign subsidiary may want to set up their own committees. There's no uh, particularly correct structure as long as the result suits the business processes. We found that the companies that have been committed to making this work will find a lot of benefit in taking that time, especially in terms of the effective collaboration and benefits for planning for reporting to senior leadership. Any governance committee typically would have oversight over security across the entire product life cycle. For many products, this will extend long before a product is actually fielded. This development process can be very important from a legal perspective as decisions made during that process can have legal implications for many years to come. And this can be challenging work for a number of reasons. For example, the effectiveness of security by design often is dependent upon the practices of a third party suppliers that make the component parts of the device. It may be very challenging to impose necessary contractual requirements or to efficiently order the practices of these parties. This challenge can be particularly pronounced for an American subsidiary of an international conglomerate. In such cases, the American company may not even have direct relationships with the supplier and must go through the intervening step of explaining to the parent company why they must make changes to long-standing relationships to meet American regulatory expectations. And even if a company can impose its preferred approach, it is inherently challenging to develop and implement security practices that will meet the challenges imposed by future unknown attacks and future regulatory expectations. In short, while none of the topics we've discussed today are simple, I'd flag that meeting security by design goals can be a particularly time-consuming challenge. Making changes in this context can be a little like trying to turn a cruise ship. But it is important work, and if a company does not take on that work now, it risks being exposed to undue legal risk for, for years to come. A final point we wanted to note is that there's extensive and highly significant ongoing policymaking activity relating to connected products. Policy proposals include legislation that would create standards for connected devices purchased by the federal government. In our experience in other areas, companies benefit from monitoring and potentially participating in the policymaking process. What's important to know here is that the creation of standards for connected products um, may require R&D to be able to meet these standards. And even non-IoT proposals can have significant impact on IoT devices, so privacy or data breach laws, for example. 
If connected devices are in scope, these proposals may be particularly difficult to meet. Unlike an enterprise system, the proposed changes and policies are rarely as simple as changing a setting on a device, and they can have significant engineering challenges based on what the policy may, re may require. So this is particularly um, a reason that's important to engage on the issue. And because this is an emerging area, there's a real risk that a policy um, could make a product or a whole category of products unworkable within these compliance obligations. So for, for these reasons, it can be valuable to make sure that policymakers understand all the implications of the changes that they are proposing. So that concludes today's webinar. We hope uh, the information shared today was useful. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.